So this is our first official OKC analytics meeting. Um, really the purpose of this group is to bring just different people from different fields kind of together to kind of show how we all work with data in very similar ways and how there's a synergistic relationship across everything that we do. And so I'll go over actually some of our core members later on in the presentation that will be giving talks kind of over time. But this first one just kind of wanted to go over some general like things that are really good to have in your analytics toolbox, mostly for your digital presence, like for so your website. So we've probably all been asked these questions, is my campaign working? What are people doing on my website? What are they clicking on? Are people converting? Is my investment paying off? I mean, what are you doing for me? I mean, this is kind of a common thing that we would get asked by clients, even internally as an analyst, get asked this a lot. And so what we're gonna actually go over a little bit are some misunderstood metrics and settings that generally Google Analytics has. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware that, you know, you just can't, when you throw the tag on the website, there's a lot of pieces on it that aren't really set up the way people wanna actually measure their website. And so there's ways you can customize it so that you don't, you get better data and you can interpret the way you want it to be. So one of the biggest things that we run into is bounce rate. So bounce rate in general is defined as, you know, a single page session. But, you know, this is when sessions in which the user leaves the site from the landing page and they don't interact with it. But what about the users? What if they click on an external link? So say they land on your website and you have a link out to like a coupon or to a partner website or something like that. What if they submit forms on your landing page in a widget form? What if they actually scroll through a blog post and read it all the way through? Um, one of the agencies I actually used to work for, our client was the NRA, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we, I actually worked on the NRA account. And so we had to track NRA, I love like article views, how long people scrolled, how much time they spent on it. So we had to add a lot of extra tracking to it. Initially though, for that website, we had the highest bounce rate. It was like 98% bounce rate. So the, the length of sessions was nearly like five seconds. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. Well, it was because they threw a tag on there and thought, oh, we get all the analytics that we need from it. It's like, eh, no, you have people actually scrolling down your page, reading your, your content, and they're doing what you want. You just don't have your measurement set up correctly. And so you can actually adjust your bounce rate. So you can control how it's defined and you can adjust it based on goals of your website. So let's say user one, here's the scenario, user one, they land on the site, they click out to a partner site. The way you track this is you enable what we call outbound link click tracking. So there's a way you can actually set up click tracking so if somebody clicks on a link that isn't within your website, it fires off an event into Google Analytics. Automatically, Google will count that hit towards the time, and so they won't be counted as a bounce any longer. Now, you do have to make sure it's set up as an interaction event. And some of these details, um, actually the next speaker for our next meeting, his name is Terry. I'm actually married to him. We used to work together in, as a, kind of a team. He's a developer, I was more of the analyst, and we worked together to set up the tracking. At the next meeting, he'll actually kind of walk through a live demo of how you set some of these things up and place some of the tracking on the website. So this is kind of a great intro piece of here's some great things to track. Now we're gonna show you how to do it. And so he'll be at the next meeting. He couldn't be here because of our little Halion. But another thing that you can do is set up like the scroll tracking. So say another user lands on your site, they read the entire article on the page and they lead from the landing page. That's when you can do scroll tracking. Um, you know, you can double check how long the user actually took to read the entire piece of content based on what we call hit timestamps between each scroll event. So there's additional kind of tracking elements you can get that are, we kind of call it enhanced tracking. So it can actually send a hit into your Google Analytics and tell you they, did they just literally take their mouse and just scroll up and down the page for like three seconds or did they actually take, you know, 15, 30 seconds between each scroll piece? So depending on, you know, your content and what your goals are, you can actually set those up. Um, another great example is if you have, if you're trying to convince somebody that your call to actions need to be moved up on the page 
or that nobody's seeing them, you can actually add custom data attributes to different sections of a website so that whenever they actually come into somebody's view, it fires off an event so you can say, look, we've only had, we've had 100 visitors to the website, but only 10 people ever actually scroll down to the area where we have your call to action. We need to move it up. I mean, a lot of times that's what you kind of have to do to show them, but if you, so when you add the tracking, I mean, you can literally probably tell within a few days and give them some data-driven, hopefully decision-making, fingers crossed. Another commonly miscalculated metric is time on site. This is one of my favorite and least favorite ones in Google Analytics. So typically this is calculated as total, what you think is total time spent on site divided by total sessions. Eh, not entirely. So let's say you have time on site. You have 30, 300 session, 150 bounces. Your total time on site is calculated as like 10 hours and 30 minutes across all of those people. Your average time on site is two minutes, six seconds. You know, you take total time on site divided by 300, you get two minutes, six seconds. And I'll show you in a minute why this is inaccurate. Because what's happening is, you know how we talked about the, the bounces? The bounces are all getting calculated as zero and they only calculate time on page for a certain subset. It doesn't include all of your sessions. So they're completely out of the equation, which is not what you necessarily want because it's kind of, a, it's deceiving a little bit. Time on page is very similar. Now this is, actually, let me rephrase. So time on site, it gives you, it does all the sessions, right? So it gives you all the bounces. Sorry, this is where this gets confusing. I've had to explain this to multiple people and I still confuse myself, unfortunately. Time on page. Now this one, it takes total time spent on the page, but it divides it by the total of number of non-exit page views, right? So time on site is total time spent on site divided by all of your sessions, including your bounces. But then time on page is total time on page divided by your non-exit page views. Very different denominators, right? Like it's incredibly confusing because I've sat in meetings with other content marketers where they told clients, it's like on average, of your 1,000 page views, people read it for four minutes, six seconds. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm just like trying to not make a face because I'm sitting there thinking, you had of your you know 1,000 page views, only 30 of them didn't exit that page. So you literally only have time on page for 30 of 1,000 page views. So that metric becomes very different when you're talking to a client, so you have to be very careful how you interpret that. And so the time on page in this, so when we look at time on page, say we had 1,000 page views, 200 entrances, 700 exits. Total time on page is five hours, 12 minutes. We get an average time on page of a minute, two seconds. This is where you take, you know, five hours, 12 minutes divided by 300. Now, what if we modified it, right? What if we took that definition and made it like how time on site was? Do you take five hours, 12 minutes divided by 1,000? Now it's 19 seconds. So it went from a minute two to 19 seconds. Huge difference, but it's more accurate, especially if you're saying, like if you made a piece of blog content and you are wanting to know how many of these page views, how long did somebody spend on site? This is actually more accurate than you saying a minute two, because this only includes people that didn't exit from that page because it's all because of how Google Analytics records like the hit timestamps for a person. Because when somebody exits a page, there's not like a delta for it to calculate a difference. And so it just has that first mark. It doesn't have a second to actually say, okay, this person spent X amount of time. So that's where adding like the additional tracking elements like the event tracking, scroll tracking. Um, we'll talk a little bit about page visibility tracking that you can do too. So you know with you're a user that has like 10 browser tabs open all at one time, which I do, I tend to a lot. You can actually set up events so you can tell when your particular tab for your website is visible or hidden. So that way your metrics aren't getting muddied by that because depending on when you have your session timeout, if it's 30 minutes by default, if you have it set up for an hour, you can actually tell of those 30 minutes how long did somebody actually 
have my pay visible to them front facing, like active. And then this is time on site modified. And so if you were to actually take out, you know, the 150 bounces, your average time on site is four minutes, 12 seconds. And I think before it was, what did we have? It was two minutes, six seconds. So you just gained over two minutes of time if you actually take the bounces out. So this is a classic case of Google Analytics not necessarily telling you this, by the way. I've it's been kind of a shock and awe moment for a lot of people, unfortunately, because they just, inherent, they just inherently take in Google Analytics word for it when it says average time on page. But I mean, this comes from, because of my background, I mean, I comb over like data users guides all the time for research. And so when I came over to marketing, I literally spent like a month reading everything I could about Google Analytics, reading all of their documentation and just kind of found these what seemed like insignificant at the time because I hadn't messed with any web data yet, but as I started using it, I was like, oh, like we actually had, funny story, uh, there was site for a client who shall not be named. Uh, they actually had an event that was firing off for whenever the slider changed, but because it wasn't set up as a non-interaction hit, even when somebody had the window, like their browser not active, it was still firing off and so it was keeping people's sessions alive. So we literally had average time on site, eight hours. And so they reported that to the client. I was. They didn't think that there was anything wrong with that? Well, cause it was, it, the site had a lot of video on it and live streamed, but yeah, you That's would. Still too much time. Yeah, it, it was way too much time. But I mean, it come, becomes a classic case where people see great numbers and they're like, oh my gosh, we gotta tell the client. It's like. How about you do the whole trust but verify thing real quick? Um, you know, it, that's one thing I always do. Anytime I find anything that looks really great when it comes to data, I double check it every single time because usually there's something I might have missed. And I'd have to say it's, it's more like probably 20 to 30% of the time, sometimes I find something small that I'm like, okay, may, I didn't include this key piece. Once I actually talk to say the other content marketers or account managers, or other team members, because that's one thing I found from the marketing side. A lot of people didn't necessarily talk to one another across teams, and so whenever I would have to analyze the data, it would literally be just this siloed view. And so when I would analyze it, I'd find something, and then I'd go talk to different teams, and I was like, oh, so this is why I saw the spike from social, because you guys actually did a promoted post. But this is why I saw this other spike, and so it would just, you know, the classic case of trying to increase communication across an entire agency that doesn't always communicate. Or even, granted, like I said, research institutes are the same way. Um, here's another example, and I actually have, I'll make sure you guys get these slides because it has the, um, like the source link for some of these. This is an engagement example for time on site, and so this just kind of shows you like the hit timestamps, right? So you have page one, first hit at 10, page two, first hit at 10.05, Page three, first hit at 10, 10. So your visit duration is 10 minutes. But then you don't know how long they spent on that last page because you only have that first hit, right? So from page one to two, you know it went from 10 to 10.05. From page two to page three, you know it went from 10.05 to 10.15 or 10.10. So you know there's 10 minutes. Well, here's where if you were to set up an engagement hit of some sort, like so something that told Google Analytics we need to calculate the difference, you could actually find out that they spent an additional five minutes on the website. And so that's where if you just have like page view tracking and you're trying to convince somebody it's like we need more than page view tracking, this is a great way to kind of show them, hey, we need to add these extra pieces because we need to know what people are doing on your, their last page. Especially if, because if you have a page that's a high bounce page, you really want to make sure you add some sort of engagement tracking because that's the only way you're going to know what they're doing on your page. There's just no, there's unfortunately no way around it for Google Analytics. Another example is where, you know, here's some different start times. So time on page three, you don't actually know it because you know from page one, it started and ended, you know, 10 seconds. Page two went from 10 to 25, so you know 15. Page three, they started and ended 25 to 50. But see, you don't know that they ended at 50 seconds because again, there's no time, like there's no extra hit coming through. And so that's where you need to add something so that you know they exited at 50 seconds and you just don't have it. 
Another example, here's where you can do like engagement hits. Uh, you can do like content area tracking or scrolling. So if you have like most pieces of content have like a beginning and middle and an end, just like any sort of like paper does. And so you can actually work with a developer to tell them, I want this section that's named header to have its own analytics kind of tag around it that says header. I want the body to have its own wrapper. I want the footer to have its own. So that way when somebody scrolls past each of those areas, it sends off an engagement hit. You can actually have that set up and you can make it to where it only counts it once so that when somebody comes down, it doesn't actually count it going back up. So you don't get you know, hit by the, because there is a Google Analytics limit. I have only ever seen one site hit that in the four years that I've been working in analytics. And it was, well actually two, and they're both news related websites. So unless you have like a news related website that has tons of articles that are reaching millions of people, you're not really gonna have to worry about the limit, but it's good to be cautious on that end just in case. Here's another example where, you know, you ha say you have the event set up, but you still don't know when they exited, right? So you have their start and exit for page one and two, but page three, you have that event set up, but you don't actually know when they truly exited the page. This is where page visibility examples can come in handy. And so this is, it's called, you can find this tracking. Um, I've actually included the link to this. And the great thing is a lot of these resources, they're publicly available. A lot of these blogs share these codes openly because they realize the only way we can get better is by sh knowledge sharing. And so they find these different kind of elements to actually add the tracking to. It's just a matter of knowing that they're out there and how to search for them. And so Analytics Ninja actually provided this great example where they added page visibility tracking. And so you can see where it has like the, the, all the hidden timestamps for each of their different blogs. And so there's a little bit of, I say a little bit, actually there's a lot of data manipulation you'd have to do outside of Google Analytics. That's the one thing that's kind of hard to convince people of because they think Google Analytics, oh, I've got everything in one place. I've got everything I need. It's like, no, you actually need to take it out of the, you need to pull it from the API, dump it into a database and actually analyze it from there. Because Google Analytics only gives you the ability to go, you know, two dimensions deep in the interface. If you pull from a custom report, I think you only get five. If you pull from the API, you actually get like seven or 10. So you get more information if you pull from the API. And so you just have to convince people it's worth taking it out is sometimes the problem because they, the fear of the unknown is how I like to describe it. Here's another page visibility example that they've provided. Um, this is what they actually calculated after they got the data. This is on that same analytics blog from Analytics Ninja. So they actually showed that, you know, that first blog had 54 page views, total page visibility, and they calculated an average page visible in the minutes. And so if you were to compare this to their actual time on page, it was completely different. But this is much more accurate. And so once, again, you get these things kind of set up and you have an algorithm worked out, I mean, you can set this up on as many websites as you want, as long as you make the tracking consistent, naming conventions consistent. That's another really difficult thing to convince people of is consistency and standardization of naming conventions. Even your tracking, we, ha we would have problems with, you know, depending on which developer touched what, they would all name them differently, they wouldn't name the elements the same, and when you start adding custom data attributes to get this kind of tracking, if you wanna be able to standardize it and automate it, you have to have standards of naming conventions in place, or it's just gonna fall apart at the seams. Uh, another one, uh, we're gonna session timeout. So does anybody know what the default is? Oh, gosh. Is it 30 minutes? It is 30 minutes. I don't know how many people really think that most people spend 30 minutes on their page by default. Um, that doesn't happen very often. And the thing with the 30 minute timeout is that say a person leaves their tab open and they don't make it, even if it's hidden or visible, it's going to keep that timer going. So they're gonna have a 30 minute time on site because they just happen to leave that browser tab open. And so, yeah, one more time. If I leave the tab open, 
Yeah. yeah. It, nope. Yeah. Neither way. It keeps it going. So like mobile phones, mobile. I'm I'm terrible. I know I'm messing up somebody's analytics all the time because I have so many tabs open. But unfortunately, I mean, unless they've reset their can't like their timeout session, it's open for 30 minutes. That's just how it works. Um, it's a default. You can set it for 30 seconds. You can set it for a minute. And see, that's just the timeout, though. So if you have all those additional tracking pieces on it, as long as somebody's engaging, it will keep tracking it. It's just that you kind of have to modify it based off of the user engagement with your website. That's where that kind of bounce rate comes in handy. So a lot of times when you set up that bounce rate to modify it, you could set up a 5 second, 10 second, 15. You could do 30 second increments, especially when a website first goes live or they first come on as a client. And you can see where is the biggest drop off happening. Then you could set that as your session timeout instead of leaving it as 30 minutes because I don't know how many times I've taken like the 30 minute sessions out because it's, it's an exact 30 minutes. That does not happen for most users. In time, I mean, it just changes everything drastically. And so it, again, it just default things that Google Analytics does just not tell you this. Kind of, it, it's a little, it's a little discouraging sometimes that they don't share this as much as you would think it would be this whole, you've installed Google Analytics, here's what you need to know about it. But they just don't do that because it's kind of the, it would be a liability, I guess, to them. They say it's all out there in their documentation, hidden in thousands of pages. So, you know, as we were talking about with the, the session timeout, you know, it kind of shows you when it expires. So if you know, for page one, they viewed it at 1401, it expires at 1431, so on and so forth. So for each hit they kept doing, it started over that counter. So if somebody lands on your site at three o'clock and they keep having hits for 15 minutes and then they leave and go to lunch, if they don't come back for 30 minutes, now you have a 45 minute session because the last timestamp is whenever that 30 second, 30 minute counter starts which is just crazy when you think about it. So this is a great example that is actually on Google's support information, <laughs> which, is, which makes me laugh. So session one, somebody lands at 1401. They view a product at 1402. They leave with the page open. 31 minutes later, they come back. They add something to the cart, and then they check out. Because it's been past the 30 minutes, now this person has two sessions, right? So this is another thing you have to keep in mind, depending on the use behaviors of your website, say it's a, a, you know, it's a digital version of a brick and mortar store. I don't know how often people would generally browse for 30 minutes, like literally leave and come back. Maybe, but this is where for situations like this, you can add kind of custom tracking to it. So there's a way you can get the session ID and client ID that Google assigns. So you know how Google tells you how many new users, returning users? You can actually t capture that information in Google Analytics. You just have to set up some additional tracking methods and you can actually get that. The same information that Google uses to calculate all that stuff where you can get IDs, which is really awesome, by the way. Like, it's fantastic. Um, that's something that Terry will share more of, like, he'll actually show, like, how, what you have to add to get that because that's something that we started doing, like we started adding client IDs, session IDs, because we kept seeing all of these, you know, few users, lots of sessions, we were trying to figure out what's the pattern here? Like what sessions could we connect to which users? And so now that we had the IDs, we exported it out and we literally did like flow diagrams, like sand key diagrams, to show our clients, it's like here's where your drop off's happening and why. So it was really useful to kind of have all of those elements and so then this person, so this is where that 30 minute timer isn't great, is when somebody, say that same person, they took 29 minutes instead of 31 minutes, they're all one session now instead of two. So really, I mean, Google Analytics gives you the capability to really customize all of this tracking for yourself, but you have to know that you can do it, honestly, in the first place, and it's just, it's hidden in the deep, depths of the admin settings of your Google Analytics. Well, and here's another one. Campaign timeout windows. This is my favorite. Anybody know the default for this one? Do you know this one, Clay? Campaign timeout? No, you got me. 
six months. Six months, that's a long time. This was, so this is a very interesting case. So I actually worked, one of the advertising agencies I worked for did a lot of tourism stuff. You guys might have seen the billboards all over town. Has road in it, Venture Road. <laughs> yeah, well we actually, so we were looking at you know, returning visitors, right? And we kept seeing people coming from these random partner websites. Like this one person came back 30 times from this partner website. We were like, so this person is going over to our partner website and clicking over to our website from this particularly small partner 30 times over the last four months. It's like, there's something wrong with that. And so as we dug into it, we realized it's because our campaign timeout window is default six months. So Google Analytics has a hierarchy, right, of how it assigns source mediums. Say a person comes direct the first time. Direct is how, you know, for that first visit, but say they click on something outside of direct, like social, a campaign link, a partner website. They keep that assignment, even if they come back to your site direct afterwards, they're gonna show up as coming from whatever source outside of direct it was which is really not that great because it's assigning all this attribution to that one source. I mean, it can be great, but is it really because of that source that they kept coming back? You wanna know if the behavior is, are they going over to that source and actually clicking over, or did you create a repeat, true repeat customer that just comes back to you directly? So that's where that campaign timeouts very deceiving. Um, you can actually see the true campaign pathway in the attribution area of Google Analytics, but you have to enable it. It's not there by default either. Yeah, I know. It, it, I, yeah. The more I look at Google sometimes, the more I just, it makes me nervous. But like, here's an example. So say three sessions, they each come from organic. This person's assigned as organic. The next time though, say the person comes direct and then organic and organic. Even if that third session they came back as direct, they're showing up as coming from an organic session. So this is where, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to reconcile Google Search Console clicks with visits from Google organic, like organic. It will not ever be one-to-one -one because of this type of thing, because the person even though the third session came direct, they're getting assigned to organic because it was the last non-direct source. It's just how Google feels like they should assign attribution, which doesn't necessarily work for everybody and it really doesn't work for most people because they wanna know after somebody did an organic search, did we create a repeat customer? You wanna know that because then that still shows that search, you know, your SEO worked but then, you know, because we've had this where they're like, oh, we're showing a thousand visits from organic, but when we gave them a search console report, it's like, you know, 600. They're like, well, where are you getting these 400 sessions from? You know, so clients can sometimes question that, especially if you don't know how to provide the right answer. We had another, so here's another great example. Say somebody came organic, they had a referral from a website, and then they came direct. Again, that person's gonna come through on that third visit as coming from that referring domain, not as coming direct. So if you have partners that you're working with, you know, you can have, you can assign more session, sessions to that partnership than you really need to. We, that's one of the problems we ended up running into is we thought that this really small partner was giving us a lot of people and it was just because of our timeout. It's kind of funny. It was like a small, like, Southwest, like, cabins on the lake place. It was so random. Like, nope, they actually didn't drive, you know, 500 sessions. <laughs> they just created a bunch of repeat customers, which is still good, but not that many sessions. And this is another way just to kind of show you just from a, like, calendar standpoint, the same slides that we just went through. So sometimes it's nice to see it both ways, not only as a sequential, but also as like an actual timeline. So if somebody came, you know, organic on January 1st, and then they accessed it directly on July 2nd, recorded in Google Analytics as direct, not organic, because the six month timeout has passed. But then 
say you've got this person, click through organic on the first, direct on the fourth, and then on the second, here's the funny part. That visit on the second still counts as organic because on the fourth, that timestamp still started over again, <laughs> even though it came as direct. So it's like this just this constant loop of insanity in some ways because it's like it just keeps assigning it over and over and over again. Yeah, I, it's a little bit, it's, it's deceiving because you would think that it would be since their first visit that they had organic and then it would time out from that first, but it just keeps reassigning it. And so to go over a couple of tools to kind of help with some of these things, um, Next Analytics, I don't know if anybody's heard of this. This is actually an Excel add-on you can get. They have it in Mac and for Windows. I personally like the Windows version a lot better than the Mac because you can get access to the code that they have, like the syntax written in the sheets and manipulate it yourself if you're comfortable writing in code and looking at, I mean, it's not, it's their own language, but you can kind of figure out the syntax for it because we've been able to figure out ways to pull from like different um, APIs in like Facebook that they didn't necessarily have set up in the point and click interface. So you can pull from Google Analytics, AdWords, Bing ads, Facebook, including the ads part, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, and this is really great for YouTube because when you look in the interface, it only gives you a certain number of videos. This, you can get the entire feed. And so we had to do this a lot for um, whenever we were looking at videos that were produced for a client. Because they were on YouTube, they were on Facebook, they were on embedded videos, as well as living on the website. And we had to do, we had to pull these every day and come up with these stylized, crazy reports every single day because it went to this national client. And they had to see it every single day. So it was... This came in so handy just to be able to pull from all those areas and we didn't have to depend on something that was pre-built by us because we found that because of how often we had to pull it and the number of changes we had to make, a lot of it broke when we built it in-house. I don't know why, we just had a lot of problems with it and they never gave us enough time to troubleshoot everything. And so we just kind of used this tool, like literally, I think it's like $40 a month and you can use it however many times you want. Honestly, for what it does, I thought it was incredibly cheap because I found a few other options. There's another one called Supermetrics that's okay, but it doesn't do what this one does. To me, this one's a little bit better because their support will actually help you do some manipulation of the syntax. Like I was able to actually pull down daily queries, like pull from the API like on a specific week or on individual days and append it all on the same sheet. It's pretty cool. And I can actually share some of the code if you guys are interested in using this program that, because it was funny, I actually helped them troubleshoot their tool a lot, so they would give me free uh, licenses to use, so I would find bugs in their system. I know, that's one way to get like free software, is be a, be a bug tracker. <laughs> Another really cool tool is uh, Search Analytics for Google Sheets. So this is a free add-on that you can add in your Google Drive to Google Sheets. This actually allows you to do Search Console backups. And so they've added some new features. I think you're able to do this now down to like the day, set up backups for every day. But this allows you to set up your Search Console downloads. So Search Console only holds your data for 90 days. So after 90 days, say you wanna go back and look at, I guess what, it's almost March. I guess if you wanna look at November. Yeah, November. If you wanna look at November Search Console data, it's gone. And so if you set up these queries that automatically pull down for you, you always have that data. And you can set up, like there's cool ways in R, like you can actually set up ways to you know, read to these sheets and actually create like R data frames from your data in the Google Drive sheets. So it's pretty neat. Again, if you guys are interested in having any of that syntax, if you guys are comfortable with R, I can share that with you because it was really helpful just to have, have these automatically set up run my R script, and then it downloaded a report of my Search Console data and saved it. Um, some data analysis collection tools. Anybody heard of SAS? Some of you guys. So SAS actually has the university edition. Now you're only supposed to use this for learning purposes. 
Um, it's their free tool. They, I don't know how long this has been out. It's been out for a few years, but you download it and it allows you to write SAS syntax. So a lot of times, unless you've had a job where you've had experience using it, people didn't really have the ability to get a free experience with it. So now they have this, you can actually download it onto your computer and you can write SAS syntax and learn how to do it. They have really great kind of libraries that you can already access to download, great tutorials. Because I don't know if a lot of people know about the cost of SAS, there's a reason why people cringe. It's because like typically just a base license that's not even on a server is around 9,000 for the first year and it's about 3,000 every year after just for one license. So I'm a big SAS user, I've used it my entire analytic career and I really like it for data manipulation and cleaning but it's incredibly expensive especially if you're like a small firm or a small shop trying to get off the ground, which is where, please don't tell anybody from SAS that I have ever said anything about this tool, <laughs> World Programming Solutions. Has anybody heard of this? This is awesome, by the way. I had it um, at a previous agency because we, we didn't, I wasn't gonna have them spend 10 grand on a license for something that, especially being the only analytics person, I was like, that's a lot for one tool. WPS uses SAS syntax and it's server based, like is so, it's cool. It's like basically it comes out to $1,200 a year for it. It's like $100 a month and that's the rate. It's what it is. Now if you get more licenses, things like that, it costs more. But honestly, $1,200 a year versus even $3,000 is a pretty big cost savings. And plus, you know, it can be server based. You can do a lot of different things with it. It doesn't have all of the same kind of interface capabilities. Like SAS has Enterprise Guide, which I absolutely love because it saves your project. You can do project flows. You can do versioning control within SAS Enterprise Guide. So it's, it's a trade off. But I also work for a big university that has these huge, you know, kind of contracts with SAS. So I kind of get that luxury of being able to do it. If you're a small group that really needs something and you really need a really good data manipulation program, WPS is a fantastic alternative. Um, R is really popular, you know, it's open source. I've actually found that I do a combination of usually three tools. It's R and Python and SAS. I do, I generally use a combination of the three because each one has its strengths SAS is wonky and doesn't necessarily connect to APIs like I'd like it to, but R and Python, no problem. Like I can connect to APIs, I can pull it down. Uh, there's, there's strengths and weaknesses to each of the three systems, but I find that they work really well together. And the cool thing about Python too is that they actually have developed a, um, sys like a library called SAS, SASB that allows you to connect from SAS into the Python libraries and write Python code. So I haven't yet played around with this. I'm going to a lot because it allows you to actually exchange data between SAS data sets and the pandas data frames, which I don't know how many of you guys have tried to deal with like R data frames, SAS data sets, and like Python data. They don't all work the same and they don't all like each other. And so I'm interested to see, <laughs> yeah, it just, yeah. I don't know why not each of the systems works the same, but like R and Python, I feel like you have to have your data from different data sets that you wanna merge structured the same. Like your data has to be in, so if you have, you know, variable one, two, three, four, you better have variable one, two, three, four in each of the data sets you wanna merge. In SAS, it doesn't care because it recognizes variable one is in position, like the fourth column in this data set and it will merge it with no issues. So this is where, you know, it's a trade-off, right? You kind of have to figure out, I personally feel like R and Python is great for really clean, like data structures, like especially for stagnant data, like when we're doing research and things like that. SAS, we gotta go with just to pull that data out. But if I'm pulling down from like APIs where I know the data structure is always the same, Python and R are great. But SAS for like stagnant data sources where you're doing survey collection or things of that nature where they change and kind of can live and breathe in a way, you got, like SAS is just kind of the go-to. It's just the nature of the beast, so to speak. Another really cool tool is called, uh, well now it's called Matomo. I don't know why they changed that. I just realized that they did this within the last few months. It used to be called Peewick. 
It's an open source web analytics platform. So if you don't like Google Analytics, which a lot of people don't, Mato this is gonna be so weird, I gotta get used to this. Matomo is a self-hosted solution. So you install it, you host it, you collect all the data. So you are responsible for any data breaches or things like that. But you can collect personally identifiable information that you can't get from Google Analytics. So technically in Google Analytics, though I've seen people do it, you are not supposed to be able to store the information that somebody submits on a form, right? And connect it to the client ID because you're not supposed to be able to identify people. I've seen examples where people have shown that you can. I don't suggest you do it because if Google finds out, you'll be in big trouble because it's like totally against their policy. They don't want you to be able to identify people to that level. PWIC though, you can do that. And here's a really cool thing that we've discovered and Terry can talk, he'll talk more about this at the next meeting. We actually found a way that you can marry the two. So you can push client ID, session ID from Google Analytics into your PWIC session and combine the two, which is really cool because then you can get all the same information from Google Analytics because most clients still want that kind of default solution that everybody's comfortable with, but you can still have PWIC to kind of get all that great supplemental information. Like you can get IP addresses if you want. This is where you can do that kind of probabilistic data matching, which is really fun. But you can't do that with Google Analytics. So it kind of allows you to use both systems. But you have to set it up and you have to push it. And so he'll talk more about what you have to do from the development side and from like the database side because that is not necessarily my realm. Uh, some other cool tools that are out there, Google Tag Assistant, I think a lot of people have used, it just tells you like how your tags are firing, gives you a happy face, a sad face, and a really angry face. Um, James is another like nice add-on, it gives you some like SEO information on it as well. Um, Tag Manager Injector, this is a cool tool. So this actually allows you to inject a, ta a tag manager onto a website. We've had to do this for a client who was really stubborn that refused to give us access to their tracking or any of their tag manager because they thought we were gonna do something, I don't know. I'm like, you're paying us to do your campaigns, like we're not gonna do anything malicious. But what we had to do is we had to inject this tag manager and add all this tracking to show them, here's what you could be getting, here's what you are getting. Just to kind of give them an example of look at all this extra information that's firing off. If you wanna get this information, we have to add it. Cause they were trying to say that we weren't giving them enough information. It's like, well, you don't have the tracking in place. And so it's a really nice way where you can literally just inject the code. It freaks people out. Like if you ever tell a client you can do this, it kind of freaks them out because they're like, are you hacking my website? It's like, nope, it's a Google thing. It's totally a Google thing. You just literally add this container. You just wrap their website in this container and you can just click around and it shows you. Built with is another cool tool. I, can, I was actually gonna, I have examples up of a couple of these I'll show you guys in a second. But built with actually tells you some underlying, like high level information about the CMS that was used for a website, kind of the relationship profile that a website has. I'll show you a really good example. There was one former client that had the same Google Analytics tag as like 50 other websites. And so we were able to tell them, it's like, you've really got a templated website because your current vendor just literally puts you in the same bucket with 50 other people. And this is why you don't want to work with them, you wanna work with us. So it could be a really great tool for leveraging that kind of stuff. These are some great blogs. Um, of course, Analytics Ninja was one of them. That I've used Simo Ohaba is like the godfather of GTM. This dude like is on top of it posts all kinds of things, he's great, he's one of like, I'd love to have a conversation with him one day and just like pick his brain for hours. <laughs> and then Oakham's Razor, I can't, I think it's Avinash, I can never say his name, I don't know if that's his real name because I've never actually met him in person, but he's another like well-known person in the Google Analytics space and just web analytics in general. He's written several books. Um, and so you know, really this is why this group was kind of formed is so that way we could knowledge share from all these other avenues. Like I'm supposed to be just a healthcare research person, but I've worked in marketing and advertising. So I offer a little bit of a different perspective. We have Rebecca Roper, who is SEM specialist. 
who will, you know, she'll eventually give a talk on, you know, the display tracking, paid search, programmatic native, whatever she feels like talking about at the time. But they're like, and we'll one day actually do almost like a panel in some ways where we're all on it so that people can kind of ask like how we work together, how this functions, why it's advantageous, because a lot of times it's hard to convince people that you need all these different types of individuals. This is a data science example. This is not a marketing, but you can, you know, build upon this and really show people. It's like you have to have different types of talent. I've worked at the last two agencies I've been at that really thought that they could get the unicorn in the middle. I mean, I know enough about some of these areas to what I, I would be called dangerous, but just enough to kind of get myself in trouble, and there's some areas that I know a lot. But this is where you can't expect somebody to know everything about all these areas. There's just no way. There's not enough brain space, in my opinion. I have yet to meet somebody that literally knows everything about this, like all of these areas. It just doesn't exist unless they're like, unless they've come up with steroids for brains, and I need it. So this, these are kind of our core members, myself, I'm a senior research biostatistician at OTRC. Susan Simpkins, she's not, she wasn't able to make it tonight, but she's a senior web designer at Oracle, and she's actually written several classes and taught several on UX design. And so when, one of her talks will actually be on UX, like data and analysis and measurement. It's something that a lot of people don't think about, but whenever you're designing a website, you should add tracking to a site that currently exists that you're redesigning so you can actually help a client understand what elements should you keep, what shouldn't you keep. And we actually had this happen with a previous client where we thought in something that nobody interacted with should be kept on this website redesign. Thank God we tracked it because we found that it was like 70% of the interactions with the page happened in that area. But we personally just didn't think nobody did it, but we're not the end user, right? Like, so it's better to track everything that you can, especially when you're redesigning it. So this is where UX research and design really is something that I think isn't appreciated enough. And so she'll talk a lot more about that in a future talk. And then Rebecca Roper, of course. And then Terry Hale, who's the senior web manager at Big Wing. And Sarah Hoffman, who's the so senior social media manager at Staple Gun. And so eventually, you know, we'll all like give different talks on each of our different subject matters, but then we'll all cohesively give probably like a larger talk to, to where people can actually ask some open-ended questions. So next meeting, Terry's going to demonstrate how to add custom website analytics tracking and discuss the benefits of utilizing a tag management tool. And I will actually show you guys. Sorry, my daughter's hip hop class was supposed to be happening. Child's hip hop classes are interesting to watch. So this is, wow, my screen. Are you, oh, no, you guys aren't able to see it because it's on a separate one. Oh. Okay, so this is next analytics. So, you know, you can start it at 40 a month. So you can get the social tool for just 20, but I think you should be able to get all of them for 40 a month and it gives you all of those options. Like there's no limit, you just download the tool and add it. Like I said, the Microsoft, the, the Windows client, I say Mac, Windows client works better than the Mac one, to be honest. The Mac one has too many bugs. I've always had to run it from like my VMware or something on my Mac, but it just works so much better. I don't know why they haven't developed them the same, but I guess there's some wonky stuff with the Microsoft products on Mac, imagine that. Um, this is just an example of how Google Sheets can look. The slide over there just kind of shows you like the options that you have to pick from. And so literally, it's a simple add-on. Like when you open Google Sheets, there's actually this area called add-ons. And you can tell it to get add-ons, and you can see it, my search analytics for Sheets shows up. And literally, that's all you do. And you start setting up your Google Search Console queries, and they just show up for you. And the cool thing is, if you write an R script to pull from, the, from this Google Drive, you can actually get the individual sheet IDs and you can pull these down as often as you need to. So you can do different analysis on it if you wanna see like changes in keyword frequency, positioning, all that kind of stuff. This is now Como. I'm so freaked out by that. 
used to be PWIC. This is the open source analytics tool. Again, you just kind of accept a little bit more of the security risk with it, but it could be a great tool to use. I like their dashboarding interface a lot better, to be honest, and it gives you automatic hit timestamp tracking, all of that. I mean, it has that granular level of information built in. So this was one I was gonna show you. I think it's still up. Yeah, so the tag manager Oh, so I think I still have it up. Yeah, so here's a tag manager injector. Literally, it's a Chrome add-on. You just, I built like a testing container and just added some general tracking that I typically like to look at. And so all I did was tell it what the GCAM container was. You know, I did a regex match, match for Wagner because I'm in the middle of trying to redesign this PI's website and his domain isn't consistent across all of his pages. He has like subdomains and stuff he didn't realize. And so this is actually, you know, I can test all this different tracking for him. And I can click on it. And so you can see, I got the, oh, where did it go? It went away. Oh, let me see you. This is on Slow Daddy, as I like to call it. <laughs> yeah, this is built with GoDaddy Website Builder, which I'm, I've never used something that was so interesting, is the best way to put it. I don't know why this isn't, it's taking a minute to refresh, but that kind of window that pops up at the bottom, that's called the Google Tag Manager Preview. I don't know if anybody's really used that, but that actually allows you to see the type of tracking that's firing off into your analytics. So you can see in real time, with a container that isn't necessarily placed on the site full time, what kind of tracking you would get. So it could be really useful if you're trying to get this placed. If developers really are being stingy and don't want to place it for you, run into that a few times because there's all this, they think, oh, there's a security risk and everything else. Not, unless you have, like, unless you really don't trust your people, there's no reason why you can't share the tag manager container, but I will say you can bring down a website with tag manager because you literally are adding code to the website, so you do want to be kind of careful and make sure everybody understands the like seriousness of what they're doing with Tag Manager because you can bring down an entire site by adding the wrong kind of code to it. It's unfortunately happened. Let's see what this one. So this is built with, so remember I told you about that client that had like the same code as several other um, ones? This is an example of a client, this client had the same exact UA tag as all of those sites that show up and they're related. Which, I don't know if anybody knows the Google Analytics hierarchy of accounts, profiles, and views. So in Google Analytics, you have your account, which is like your first tier, your profiles, then your views. A lot of agencies will put everything under one account, which is a big no-no, in my opinion, because what happens is, say you leave that agency and you want your Google Analytics, before they used to be able to say, well, I can't give that to you because it's under my master account. They can't do that anymore now because you can actually move a profile from an account out to a new one. So if an agency ever tells you that they are keeping your data, tell them to go shove it personally because they can give it to you. We ran into this before, at a, like where clients have worked with other agencies that have set their analytics like this. But if you actually go into your interface, I might be able to, let me see if I can. So you can move your property. That did not need to be there. You must go added within like the last year but okay, it put that in there? it's been there for like a year at least uh -huh. they I use an I use feedly for RSS feeds and so I've that's been a really useful tool to keep up to date with all of this because Google does not just have one feed or central repository where they put all of this 
I can like send you guys the various RSS feeds I follow for Google, and that's the only reason why I know most of this stuff is because I have several that I've set up and that I follow. Because this was something that I didn't know until a few months after, and it was buried. I know, like, it's an incredibly useful feature, though, because if somebody says that they can't give you your property analytics, they can now. It's just that, again, if you didn't know it was there, because you don't see it when you log in, you have to go to the admin, then you have to go to property settings. And this is where you can set up like your default URL. You can, and see, here's another great one. You have to enable demographics tracking. So you don't natively collect gender and age, you actually have to enable that in this area. So even when you add the analytics tag, you have to enable it right here in order to get it. I don't know if that's, because there's the interest reports, it could be most of the time, like, mo well, I guess not all sites, let me rephrase, because we work, <laughs> not everybody has a privacy policy on their page. And there's in-page analytics, but here's the weird thing. So you can put all of this event tracking and everything else on it to get like your in-page analytics tracking. I can't remember why they just don't enable this necessarily for you to be able to track it. But see, you can get the user analysis so you can get user level information on it. Because this is tied to, um, this is actually tied to, I can't remember where the other section is. This is tied to interest reports, so that might be part of the reason why it's like that. Because if you enable it, you get demographics, and you also get what they call interest. I don't know if anybody's ever messed with that. They're, I don't, they're, I don't know how useful they are. I've never really, have you ever really used them? I never really um, used them. If you look at it from the interface, I don't know how useful it is to most people. I've had, I've worked for a client that kind of misused it in, on, in all honesty and they took it and interpreted it way differently than they should have. Like they're like, oh, look at all these people we're getting for that like all of these things. It's like, mm, no, that's not what that, it's more for being able to use for advertising pieces. The age and gender is nice to have just in the interface, but you have to enable it and it's sampled. So that's another thing to keep in mind is when you enable that, like if your site only has like 100 people and say, you know, you, you got people coming from different areas, well actually no, county level and all of that's tracked already, but if you have a small subset of it, it will actually only show you like the larger groups. It won't show you that you've had one 18 year old necessarily. Because again, it becomes identifiable. Because in Google Analytics, you can pull age, gender, and state but if you start going down to city and zip, it starts sampling and it won't give it to you. Like I've actually, on smaller sites, it's been like, nope, we won't run this because they're too small. I can't remember what this last one was. Oh, so this is something that Terry will, I don't know if he'll do it at this next one, but data visualizations are a big thing for like displaying information these days. And so as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words, a moving picture is worth exponentially more. And so this was one he built for a client a long time ago when he did a si business on the side, but it actually shows like the, the, diff like the number of security controls you have to take into account and showed how many there were. So it showed why people needed to work with the security firm and not try and do it themselves because it is incredibly complicated. And he built this like six years ago and the person still uses it for business and he he like literally just puts these up on a screen and allows people to come and play with it and they'll be like I do not want to mess with this at all please just do this for me so it's kind of where data visualization not only can tell a compelling story with your data internally but then depending on your business can also help you get new clients so depending on how long you do it so he'll eventually go over some of these
actually, so here's your family, so it kind of grew out, and so how many there were. We've actually thought about kind of using this to show like some of the documents that we've, how many publications we've done in for the research facility and actually breaking them out and having the PDFs available so people could click on them. You could use this for policy information, all kinds of stuff. Possibilities are really kind of endless. So that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for coming today. Oh, no problem. Well, I'll add like um, our general 